the whole purpose of this trip is to go and see the Aral Sea. That's the ultimate goal. But, and it's a big but in, in capital letters, but I want to go to this island, Vos Island. However, it was a Soviet biological weapons testing site. <laughs> How clean is it? No one seems to know. Everyone now has admitted that it was used for testing, open-air testing, of all sorts of nasty smallpox, uh, Venezuelan equine encephalitis, Q fevers, uh, things I've never even heard of. Anthrax is a big one. And anthrax is the big danger because anthrax lasts a long time. It's been cleaned up, but no one seems to know how effectively. So I'm well equipped. and I've been briefed on how to uh, protect myself from what is just an instantly fatal disease. But at the same time, that makes me rather nervous, to say the least. This was it. After more than 2,000 kilometers on the road, I had finally reached my destination, the site of one of the world's worst environmental disasters. With me was Zanat Makambatova, an ecologist working with one of the many NGOs in the disaster zone, which is, or rather was, the Aral Sea. Yes. How long have these ships been here? Since the 80s. Zanat took me to see a surreal ship graveyard. The sea level was once as high as the cliffs that surrounded the site, and these fishing boats were left high and dry, stark reminders of the misguided Soviet cotton irrigation schemes that diverted the rivers that previously fed the Aral. It's such a dramatic picture of these dead ships without the sea anywhere. You can't see the sea anywhere at all, can you? So, it's a symbol? It is a symbol. Of a uh, disaster? Symbol of the disaster. Okay. And all my life I saw that we do not have sea anymore. And when people asked me, okay, you're from the Aral Sea region, uh, okay, uh, where is the sea? I said, okay, we do not have sea. We do not have sea. You thought it had completely disappeared? Yes, yes, yeah, I was absolutely sure in this. And uh, when I came to the sea in 90, 1996, and the first time I, was see, I saw it, I was shocked. These rusting wrecks were part of a once huge fleet taking up to 44,000 tons of fish from the Aral each year. Now the tonnage taken is barely worth measuring. It, it must have been employment for many, many people. Yeah, yeah, many people worked on the ships. Zanat explained that the majority of the Aral fishermen turned to breeding livestock, such as camels. Others, unable to eke a living out of the highly saline and polluted seabed, were forced out of the region and into an uncertain future elsewhere. Gosh. I wonder what the camels think. That evening, 60 kilometers east of the stranded ships, we found the shore, and a lone fisherman laying out his nets. This form of subsistence fishing is all that is left on the Aral Sea, mostly catching introduced saltwater species like flounder, which can cope with the high levels of salinity. Yeah, quite salty, isn't it? Yeah. I don't think it's quite as salty as the sea, but almost. Somewhere out there was my final destination, the island of Vosrozdine, the toxic heart of this dying sea. After crossing Kazakhstan, I had arrived in the northwest corner of the Aral Sea at the village of Kulandi. I was hoping to make contact with villagers rumoured to be looting an abandoned bioweapons site on an island in the sea. When the Aral shrank in size, these former fishing villages faced a stark future. But as I had already discovered earlier in my journey, the Kazakhs are past masters at adapting to a life in an extreme environment. In order to survive the potentially life-threatening hazards ahead, I would need expert guidance and help. Looking, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. It was time to rendezvous with Dave Butler. 
a specialist advisor with a useful working knowledge of how to survive nuclear and biological threats. It's highly carcinogenic, so we don't want to breathe it in. Of course, you have to bear in mind, of course, that death can be fatal from <laughs> breathing this stuff in. Yeah, right, I'll remember know. that, so, uh, The pack itself contains its own three-litre water supply. Mm -hmm. We'll take another litre or so just in the, just in the top there. I've uh, had some quite loose bowel movements in the last 24 hours. Um, I've taken some stoppers, but what's the story with the suits? Can you actually... Yeah, if, if we need to, we'll take you through a quick urination and defecation drill. You know, because, uh, again, there'll be no question of doing it in the suit. You know, so <laughs> yeah. If you do it in the suit, I mean, let alone anything else, none of us will want to be around you because you'll stink. Yeah. You know, so uh, we'll, we'll just, uh, we'll cope with that. But just try and give me a bit of notice, you know, if you, if you are feeling a bit queasy. Okay, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I'll take some more bump stoppers. Yeah. Just to be sure. Good. I think mean, it's time for dinner, don't you? Yeah, good idea. It's uh, 20 past 7, uh, the night before I'm due to go to the island, and uh, I just came out for a pass water and saw that on the horizon. And it looks like a cloud, but it's completely different from the clouds up above. I can only think it's got to be a dust cloud, and it's vast, like 180 degrees along the horizon up there. You can see the leading edge of it, and it's, oh, that's west because the sun's setting. And the whole thing's just coming, <laughs> coming towards us. And it's a phenomenal size. Absolutely extraordinary. I've never seen one the size of this before. And no one seems to be uh, taking that much notice. But the wind is definitely freshening. I don't know if you can hear those camels. But uh, they think something's going on. The dust storm had been created by an incoming weather front, whipping up thousands of tons of particles into the air. So it's a true dust storm and a vast one. I've literally never seen anything this size before. And you know what, it's extremely lucky that we're going to the uh, island tomorrow because if this had happened on the island, well, I mean, just be anthrax city, wouldn't it? It would be everywhere, absolutely everywhere. It's extraordinary. <laughs> It's really great, really great. Everyone's going in their houses, but it's just good to be out there. I don't think the cameras like it very much. Extraordinary, really extraordinary. We were going to Vosrozdeny in the morning, and I couldn't decide whether the dust storm voted good or ill. This is it. The uh, vehicles are getting ready to leave. And now's the time we start wading out to the boats. Fortunately, it's not that deep. I don't think, just looking uh, at the guys who are wading out there now. This is the moment. This is when it really all begins. Through a series of local contacts, a team of looters had agreed to take us to Anthrax Island. Former fishermen, the men were victims of the Aral Sea's decline, and facing a future without work, they had turned to looting old Soviet sites, stripping out copper pipes and building materials. I was sympathetic to their plight, but I couldn't help wondering if what they told me was the whole story. The island is rumoured to have numerous burial sites where lethal drums of anthrax were left by the Soviets, and I couldn't help wondering what the market value of such a commodity might be in the post-9-11 world. Welcome to Anthrax Island. As far as we knew, we were the first British people ever to set foot in this place.
As soon as we arrived, even though the former research base was still 25 miles away, Dave advised me to put on the bioprotection suit. We offered the same suits and masks to the locals, but astonishingly, they declined our offer, telling us they'd visited the site many times and never got sick. Riding pillion on the rickety old bikes, we left for the two-hour desert ride to the bioweapons site. We got there just before midday, as the temperature nudged up above 40 degrees. The looters vanished into the city on their mysterious mission, leaving us alone to explore this deeply disturbing ghost town. <laughs> <laughs> 